The last time that I spoke, we looked at the topic of addiction. We looked at the topic of what addiction is in some small degree, how it affects the mind, how it affects relationships. We looked at the fact that, that number one, we can be learning to help people now. We can be learning about addiction so that we can be of help to our brothers and sisters now as God calls people, as, as the brethren go through challenges. And of course, we are training to help a large number of people in the future as well, to be in the family of God, on the team of God, working to heal the nations, to heal the minds and the hearts and the, the lives of those who will be resurrected. And secondly, and, and possibly more startlingly, we sort of faced the fact that we have suffered from addiction as well. You and I, everyone under the, under the sway of Satan, has become addicted to behaviors that are not right. And we need to be among those who are struggling. Deeply entrenched behaviors that, that get hardwired into our brain that we need to be fighting against, that we need to be working on, overcoming with God's help. So the question is then, how do we begin or proceed along the road to recovery? What does that recovery process look like, not only for ourselves as we try to draw closer to God, as we try to step further and further away from former ways that were sinful, but as we try to assist others in a recovery process? Today we're going to look at just a few steps in that healing process. Because again, we've, we've been hearing so much about the fact that God is about healing relationships. He's about healing lives, healing minds, and all the other influences in this world work in the opposite direction. So today we're going to look at a few of the steps in the healing process. We will see how when we come to view these from God's perspective, keeps us centered on His way of thinking and on what he would approve of. And it will increase our effectiveness as we grow personally and as we help one another to grow. And so the title of this message is Addiction, Beginning the Recovery Process. Because again, you and I have come out of lifestyles. You and I have patterns of behavior. And if not patterns of behavior, then certainly we stumble here and we stumble there and we are in that recovery process. I recently picked up a, a book by the Al-Anon Al people and their main goal is in helping families of alcoholics, helping families of alcoholics, friends of alcoholics to, to help, to be helpers in that healing process. And the first step that they outline in their, in their literature is that the individual needs to admit that they are powerless over whatever the addictive force is, whether it be alcohol, whether it be some persistent sin that one of us is having trouble putting behind us for good, whether it's some other substance, some other behavior. They promote as, as step one, that a person should admit their powerlessness over alcohol. Now again, I, I was a little bit unaware of the fact that Al-Anon is, is just for friends and family versus Alcoholics Anonymous, which sounds like the same thing, but actually AA is, is for the alcoholics themselves. And again, this, this transmits perfectly well to other addictions besides merely alcohol. But again, that first step, I admit that I was powerless over fill in the blank and that my life had become unmanageable. And isn't that what the, isn't that what the conversion process is like? As God begins to work with us, we begin to realize 
that we are falling so short, and without his help by ourselves, we are not going to make it. Now, addict, the addict typically feels like they're in control. Back before you were called, you probably thought things were going great. Everything's going fine. I've got my goals. I've got my plans. I know where I'm headed. I've got everything figured out. That feeling of control, it's false feeling. We all can most likely relate to that thought. And somebody on the outside might be looking at the decisions being made and they might see the folly in it and want to help. But nobody can convince the addict that what they're doing is destructive. Nobody can convince the addict that they are really powerless. It's a realization that everybody has to come to. You know, they might say, well, I don't have a problem. Yes, I do this or I do that, but I don't have a problem with it. I'm able to live my life perfectly well. I still get to work. I still do my job. I, my, my spouse is still with me. We still have, you know, or I, they say, I can quit any time. I can quit any time. It's pointless to argue with the addict who's, when they're in this state. Everybody has to reach that, that realization in their own time. And it's hard because many of us, when we began to know the truth, we may have tried to convince somebody, well, you should be keeping the Sabbath. It says it right here. It says it hundreds, seemingly hundreds of times. You should be doing this. You should be doing that. You should be stop doing that, whatever it might be. But until the person is ready to hear it, we're, we're just more of a pest and a pain than we are a help. And so again, the goal of this group, Al-Anon, which I'm just picking on as a pretty good analogy to what you and I should be doing with our lives, the goal of this group is to train people away from those behaviors that push others away. We all know that in the cold light of looking at things honestly, we're not going to walk up to somebody and start haranguing them for, for not keeping the law and har or haranguing them for something they're doing, and we're not going to expect that that behavior is going to draw them to God. We know that's foolish. Well, the same thing is, is true if a brother is having troubles. We, we don't want to walk up in, and assault them verbally because not only is, is that person who is suffering from the addiction powerless to change their behavior, so are you and I. That's, that's the main thrust of this, of this first tenet of theirs is that there's some higher power needed. In Proverbs 12 and verse 15, just turn over there briefly. Thinking about Saul as he was out doing what he knew to be right. Saul was out and he was distressing and destroying those who followed Jesus. In Proverbs 12 and verse 15, it says, The way of a fool is right in his own eyes. The way of a fool is right in his own eyes. But he that listens to counsel is wise. If, you would have, if somebody would have walked up to Paul and tried to have a rational, reasonable discussion with Saul about, you know, let's, let's discuss the merits of Christianity and Saul would not have been convinced because he was right in his own eyes. He would not have been convinced by any kind of reasonable argument. He had all the degrees. He had all of the education. He had the seal of approval of, of the leaders in the Jewish faith, and he had no interest. He was not going to be convinced by logic. He was not going to see anything until God got his attention. We know that he was struck blind on the road and, and he heard a voice and that got his attention. It's up to God to get that attention. But we can certainly help as, as God leads us through His Holy Spirit. Let's take a look at Isaiah chapter 5. Of course, we know that this Addiction, whether it's, it's 
somebody in this room and their, and their difficulty shaking, a, again, a persistent sin or, or turning their life completely over to God's direction, or whether it's somebody who's out abusing drugs or alcohol or, or some other addiction, it causes great hurt for themselves. It causes great hurt for the people around them, for their family members. In Isaiah 5 and verse 21, it says, Woe unto them who are wise in their own eyes and who are prudent in their own sight. Again, this woe that it's talking about is there's a lot of damage that gets done when we think, when we refuse to listen to God, when we, when we refuse to see what His Word says, there's a lot of damage and hurt that gets done. But again, when, when a person is in that, they don't see it. When Saul was out there chasing down Christians, he thought he was doing great things. He didn't see that he was actually working against Jesus the Christ and God the Father. He didn't see it as damage. He saw it as, as serving God. Let's take a look at Acts chapter 2. Again, you and I, apart from God, are powerless over... We're powerless to change ourselves. We're powerless to help the way God would want us to help anybody else. But with God's help and with submitting to God and with asking for His input, we can be helpers. We can be helpful. In Acts chapter 2 and verse 14, it says that Peter, standing up with the eleven, lifted up his voice... And so, to, and so he began to preach, preach to these individuals. Preach to them how that they had crucified the Son of God. And that they needed to listen to what God was doing. Now surely some were moved. Some were not. We know that God worked with some of these people. And their consciences were were pricked within them, and some were moved and some were not. We know that in verse 37, that it says that some, when they heard, were pricked in their heart and said unto Peter and to the rest of the apostles, men and brethren, what shall we do? So again, it, it wasn't that Peter used eloquent words. It wasn't that Peter had the perfect, logical, reasonable argument. It was that God was speaking through Peter and that God was working in the hearts of these individuals. So whenever we go about to help a brother, whenever we go about to work on our own difficulties, we need to make sure that we're going to God. We need to make sure that we are getting His backing, because if it doesn't have His backing, it's going to fall flat. Just like we hear about in the New Testament about some false teachers who had arisen and claimed to be Christ, and they gathered some people together and the organization fell apart and they were scattered and nothing happened because God wasn't behind it. So it, it fell to pieces. It certainly, Peter would not have claimed any, you know, Peter wouldn't have said, well, yes, yeah, because of my great preaching that they were converted and repented. He knew that it was the power of God that helped these people to come to realize and come to see that they needed to change their lives. And so that's the, the main point for this first point. Admitting our powerlessness apart from God. But Peter didn't just sit there. He got up and he preached because he was led by the Holy Spirit to say those words. And because God was behind it, they had great effect. So we know that God hasn't called us to, to sit around on our hands. But we have to make sure that we are working according to His will. In James chapter 5 and verse 19, we read, Brethren, if any of you is in error and has departed from the truth, and one brings him back, if any of you, if any of us were to depart and another of us were to go and have that conversation, that loving conversation, that conversation led by God, after you or I has, has prayed about it, has asked for the right words to say. Because our duty is to pray for our brother. 
Pray for our sister. Our duty is to give that godly counsel, is to speak those words, allowing God to form the words in our mind and to speak them. If any of you departs from the truth and one converts him, let him know that he who converts the sinner from the error of his way has saved a life from death and shall hide a multitude of sins. We can be part of that process if we're relying on God for the direction. We, if we're relying on His input, asking Him, perhaps you've seen a, a situation that you think needs addressing. Pray about it. Pray about it. Possibly seek counsel about it from, from the ministry. God leads His people to give that godly counsel, that kind of counsel that helps somebody to turn around. Because again, in that example with sermons, Peter's sermon, there was God working in the hearts, but he was also working in the messenger. Luke chapter 15 contains the parable of the prodigal son. And just bring up a couple of points in that story. Because you, if you think about it, if, if your son came to you and says, okay, Dad, I want, I want half of everything. I'm going to go on. I'm going to go to Vegas, and I'm going to hoop it up. What would you say? I doubt you'd say, okay, that sounds good. I'm all, I'm with it. Okay, here you go. Surely the father tried talking sense to his son. Surely the father said, well, now you realize, and, and gave him some good counsel. You realize this isn't going to end well. You realize that people are going to take advantage. People are going to pretend to be your friends while you've got all this money, and pretty soon it's going to be gone, and they will be gone too. I'm sure his father, the father in this parable, and again, it's, it's, it is just that, a parable. It's not necessarily a, a true story. It gives us great insight into the love of God the Father. Let's take a look at verse 11. It says, A certain man had two sons, and the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the portion of goods that falls to me. And he divided unto him his living. But again, sh certainly, between the request and the father acquiescing to this, there must have been some long talks. There must have been some, you know, why is it that you want to do this? What, what? There must have been some fatherly advice in there. He knew that the path that his son was thinking about was, wasn't going to, again, end well. He could have just said, no. No. Wait, you know, if you want to do that, that's fine. But you're going to wait till I'm dead and in the ground, and then when you have your part, then you can go make your choices. He could have said no. But what would the son then have felt? The son would have been resentful. He wouldn't have learned anything. He would have just been basically standing around waiting for his father to die. That's not a relationship. We see that the way God wrote this parable and Jesus delivered it, the son comes back encouraged. The son comes back you know, through what he experienced, he came to appreciate his father. He came to have respect for his father. He came to regret his former foolishness. And he repented. We know that, I love the phrase, when he came to himself. It kind of means to come back from being out of your mind, basically. It means very, very much similar to that. That when he came to himself, he, he realized what he had done and how he had chosen poorly. And this is in verse 17. When he, again, when it uses that phrase, he came to himself. He came to his senses, basically. So likewise, you and I, when we see a brother making a mistake, we can take a hard line. We can go and try to be loud and vociferous and, and in a sense, push them away. The father could have yelled at his son and said, no, it's, this is foolishness and ridiculous and I'll have no part of it. And then what? The son would have left and he probably never would have seen him again. 
So again, it's it's a line, it's a fine line. We need to go to God in prayer and ask Him, and again, seek the advice of people around you whom, in whom you have seen God's wisdom. What's the right way to handle this? A second step in the in this book that I was looking at is that a person must come to believe that God can restore to sanity. And again, this this verse 17 of of Luke 15, when the son came to himself, means pretty much just that, a restoration to sanity. All of a sudden, wow, I can think clearly again. So again, their second step in their program says that a person must come to believe that God can restore them to sanity. Because, again, uh, now this this certain organization that I was looking at, they have chapters all over the world. They, they use the phrase higher power to mean whatever your conception of that higher power is, whether it's, you know, a, a Muslim or a Mormon or a Jewish or a... But, of course, we know that there is truth in that statement that God can restore to sanity. In Psalm chapter 51... Actually, one of the hymns that we sang earlier today, that topic of of restoration was there. I think it was from Psalm 86. But we're going to take a look at Psalm 51 because we know that David had damaged his relationship with God. He had gone out and, and been that prodigal son, if you will, had gone just completely 180 degrees away from where he should have been. And so in Psalm 51 and verse 12, he's, he's pleading here. <clears throat> Much of this psalm is, is a pleading psalm. He says in verse 9, Hide your face from my sins and blot out my iniquities. Verse 10, Create in me a clean heart and renew a right spirit that compass pointed in the right direction within me. In verse 12, he says, Restore unto me the joy of your salvation. What is what is what does that mean? The joy of your salvation. Well, when we have that right relationship with God, we know that in other places David is called a man after God's own heart. And when David was in that right heart, when he had his mind and his heart pointed towards God, he understood that there was a kingdom of God coming. He had that joy based on his knowledge that he was following God and that there was a relationship. And so when he says, restore unto me the joy of your salvation, he's saying, I, I want that relationship back so that I can have confidence and faith. Confidence that I'm back on the path. Confidence that confidence that he was back following God's way. He believed that God could restore that. We need to believe that about ourselves because we, again, countless times fall short And have to go on our knees to God and ask for help, ask for forgiveness, ask to be restored. It's very much a Feast of Atonement sort of a theme. But likewise, certainly we're not supposed to be self-focused. Likewise, we, we pray for our brothers and sisters. Even if we don't know what trouble they're going through, we pray for them to be in a sound relationship with God the Father. In Philippians chapter 4, in verse 13, is this our motto? Does this verse describe how we feel, the fact that we are not powerful on our own? But in verse 13 of Philippians chapter 4, he says, I can do all things... Through Christ who strengthens me. Again, it's only with God behind us that we are going to do the right thing. It's only when we are pointed in the same direction as God the Father that we are going to be pleasing Him, that we are going to be doing all things. And obviously, it's not talking about anything that would hurt or harm. It's talking about I can do all necessary things. We can achieve victory over sin. We can achieve victory over addictions that we have. We can be tools 
that God can use. We can be helpers whom God can use to help encourage and restore his children. And we need to be asking asking for God to be using us as those tools. Let's turn to Isaiah chapter 42, please. In Isaiah chapter 42 and verse 16, a prophecy of, of restoration. He says, I will bring the blind by a way that they have not known. I will lead them in paths that they have not known. I will make darkness light before them, and I will make the crooked ways straight. These things will I do to them, and I will not forsake them. Again, we can't come to see, nobody can come to see, oh, that's the truth, oh, that's what I should be doing, unless God reveals it, unless he takes that darkness and removes it. He says, we just read several ways that God desires to bring success. He desires for us to all be successful in pursuit of his kingdom. He desires for us to have peace. Again, that peace, that joy that King David was talking about, being restored to, knowing that we are following God's path, that we are working towards his kingdom. And so it is like sight to a blind person. When you were called, you had no idea before that which way was the right way to go. God opened your eyes. You had, you'd never seen this path before. I will make them, I will lead them in paths they have not known. Go to the feast? What's the feast? You know, why should, I'm going to stop eating this and I'm not going to do that anymore and I'm going to, paths that we had never known before. Righteous paths that only God can reveal. But again, you and I can be helpers in restoring if we are looking to God and asking him how he would like us to be used. A third point, or the third point in this book that I was looking at, is that a person needs to make a decision to turn their life over to God. So the first step, again, admit I'm powerless over this thing that I'm struggling against. Second point, I believe that God can restore me to sanity. And so third point then is, okay, I'm deciding to turn my life over to God. And, of course, for you and I, that's, that sounds like baptism. That sounds like a baptism, and it sounds like repentance, which all comes from God. Let's take a look at Acts chapter 2. We were there a while ago, but we'll take a look at a different part of the chapter. A decision has to be made. Okay, what I've been doing hasn't been working. What I thought I was in control of, I really wasn't in control of. What I thought were the right priorities really weren't the right priorities. God's showing me what to do. And so in part, this is a, sounds like conversion, but it can also be when we've been converted, when we've been walking on the true path, and we fall. And all of a sudden, okay, what I used to know the truth, and I used to follow it, and now I've fallen off the path, and I've gotten into something, and we, we can so soon forget And we need that restoration to get back on the path. So in Acts chapter 2, let's take a look at verse 37. Again, in verse 37, it says that when these formerly non-believers heard Peter's message, they were pricked in their heart and said unto Peter and to the rest of the apostles, What shall we do? And so, of course, Peter advised them, Well, you need to repent and you need to be baptized and to receive God's Spirit. So in verse 41, 41, it says, Then those who gladly received his word were baptized. So again, God was working in the hearts and minds of some of these people. Some gladly received the word and they were baptized. Some didn't and weren't. And about the same day, there were about 3,000 baptisms. So they took that step. They believed that baptism was the right way to go. And they decided and made move toward turning their life over to God. 
But you and I know it doesn't stop there. You don't just get baptized and say, okay, I'm good now. I've turned my life over to God. You know, you say the, say the words, whatever it is. In verse 42, it says, they continued. That's the hard part. Continued. They continued steadfastly. Doubly hard. They continued steadfastly in the apostles' teachings and fellowship and in breaking bread and in prayers. So we know that this decision that we're talking about isn't a one-time decision. You don't say, well, okay, I'm going to give up cigarettes. Um, that's it. And then you walk back and go back to your regular routine. And, and addiction is not that easily gotten rid of. We have to continue in a, in a process, continue in a, a letting God reform our minds to think along His wavelengths. And again in verse 46 here it says, And they, continuing daily with one accord in the temple. So again, continuing to listen to the apostles, continuing to be taught, continuing to fellowship together daily. You and I fellowship weekly, and I know that I'm very grateful for that opportunity. But at this time, they were, they were very close proximity, and they were continuing daily with one accord. Again, this is, that's what Jesus prayed for so many times. May they be one. They were in one accord. Continuing daily in the temple with one accord, breaking bread from house to house, and eating their meat with gladness and sincerity of heart. Again, sincerity. They didn't just make some statement about, okay, we're giving our life over to follow God. No, they acted on it, and they continued in it, and they used sincerity. We have made a commitment, many of us, and others of us are pondering that same commitment of baptism. And, of course, once we know, once we make that commitment, we certainly have to continue in it because... It's a lifelong thing. Again, just like addiction to a chemical substance or to a behavior, if we ease up and take it easy on ourselves and stop drawing close to God every day, we're going to find ourselves right back where we were. We're going to find ourselves back in that trouble, back in a broken relationship, and having to re-seek that restoration of that relationship. The fourth tenet that they have in their list of 12 steps is each person must make a searching and fearless inventory of themselves. A couple of pretty good adjectives there. A fearless inventory. Do we know what our real motivations are? Do we just assume that we have high motives and or do we ask God to show us? Let's take a look at Psalm 139. Again, a lot of King David's prayers and songs, very, very heartfelt, very impassioned. In Psalm 139 and verse 23, he says, Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts. And, of course, he wasn't just saying, look for stuff and get rid of it. He was saying, look for what there is in my thinking and show me and root it out of me. Verse 24, he says, see if there's any wicked way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. Like Jesus said, he is the way. There is a way that leads to life. And there's a way that leads to death. It's so easy for us to see faults in somebody else, look across the room, yeah, that person's not doing that right. Yeah, it looks like they're in a, you know, we can point fingers. Hopefully we are giving much prayer and, and thought to purging that from our lives. But it's so easy to, to notice faults in others and so hard to see them in ourselves. So again, this fourth point of make a searching and fearless inventory of ourselves. I don't care what you have to show me, Father. I don't care, you know, let me have it, is kind of what King David was saying here. Let's turn to Psalm 19. Now, it's 
God is merciful. God is extremely merciful. In, let's see, Psalm 19. And so he doesn't just say, okay, well, you hear, here, here's your list of 20,000 things to work on. They're all terrible. They're all awful. They all need to be gotten rid of. Here you go. He doesn't work that way with us because he's very merciful. He helps us to see things that need changing. And when we show that, that we will continue, that we will work on, okay, I'll work on those couple things. Thank you for showing me. Please show me more and help me with these. Then he will help us to get rid of some of those aspects of our character. Because again, it's not just that people sin, it's that people are sinful. And we have to come to realize that everything about us is contrary to God before he begins to work with us. In Psalm 19 and verse 12, he says, who can understand his errors? Again, if I did it, it must be right. If, if, if you know, the way I said that, yeah, it might have sounded mean, but I know what I meant, and it was probably fine. And, or you could pick on anything. Which of us has an easy time spotting our own faults? That's probably not very many of us. Now, sometimes, of course, we can be even too hard on ourselves. Usually we vary somewhere between glossing over everything we've done wrong and not really thinking it's a very big deal, and then on the other side of the coin, we are kicking ourselves and, and chastising ourselves. But again, we are incapable of seeing. Who can understand his errors? He says in the end of verse 12, cleanse me from secret faults. Ask God to show us where we need to change. Ask God to show your brother where he needs to change. Ask God to show all of his people where we need to change. Because it's not me walking up to somebody and saying, you're doing this wrong, that's going to have a great effect. It's God showing them. And if we go to God and we ask him for the right words, then we can sometimes be a part of that help. Ask God to show us, ask God to show other people their faults. Ask him to help root those faults out. Ask him to help all of us to see you know, in those blind spots, we'll have blind spots. There's something that, just like we're driving down the road and you start to change lanes and somebody honks and you didn't realize because they, they were in your blind spot. We all have blind spots when it comes to ourselves. So again, he says, who can understand his errors? You need to cleanse me from my secret faults. So we have to ask God for that. Please turn to 1 John chapter 4. Again, there's a couple of different psalms where it uses the phrase, His mercy never fails. His mercy never fails. Our God is very merciful. Just like, again, that the father of the prodigal son. He knew that a different sort of answer wouldn't have led to the right outcome. He knew that he certainly advised his son in, in this example, in this Terrible, but he handled it perfectly because, of course, he knows what it takes to get our attention. He made us. He made our minds. He designed us. And he alone knows the best way to slowly move us until we are facing the right direction. So in 1 John chapter 4 and verse 16, he says, we have known and believed the love that God has for us. God is love, and he who dwells in love dwells in God, and God in him. It says in verse 17, herein is our love made perfect, or mature, or, or full, that we may have boldness in the day of judgment. Again, when David prayed, restore unto me the joy of your salvation, he was kind of praying this, please give me that boldness that I can look forward to the day of judgment with hope rather than with fear. That we may have boldness in the day of judgment because as he is, so are we in the world. It says in verse 18, there is no fear in love. We don't have to fear. 
God's motives are pure. His motive is to cleanse you and I, to train us up, to teach us as children. He will mercifully lead us through all the things that we need if we will submit to Him. So he says, there's no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear. Perfect love casts out fear. He who fears is not made perfect in love. So again, just like King David prayed for, we need to pray for that perfect love so that we are not, so that we are confident in what God has promised. And again, his mercy never fails. That's Psalm 136 is one of the Psalms where where you, we can read King David just listing out item after item about how God shows such mercy to his people. God gives us space. Just like in the parable of the prodigal son, God didn't say, nope, you ain't leaving. You ain't getting a dime. You're staying right here where I keep an eye on you. That's not what the father said in that parable. God gives us space. He gives us space to make choices. We get counsel on what a good choice would look like, but He gives us the space to make the choice. He gives us the space to make mistakes, and He gives us time to come to see that He is right, because of course He is right in everything that He tells us, in every warning that He gives us. Sure enough, if we ignore that warning, that thing is going to come upon us that we were warned about, and if we obey, that promise that we are told of will come about. He warns, He teaches, but of course He gives us our free will. Everybody gets to choose. Again, because He doesn't want a family of robots. He doesn't want, He's not trying to build a, a, a family of, of people who only do what they're supposed to do because that's what they've been programmed to do. We have free will. We have the ability to choose because that's the perfect way to do it. So much in the same way that God doesn't badger us and beat us over the head and enforce changes in us, we need to not treat others in a badgering sort of a way. Because people change when God leads them to change. We should give wise counsel if it's appropriate. We should take our concerns about our brother and sister to God in prayer. We should encourage. We should be encouraging. We should show God's love. We should be a positive example in all that we do. And so in the same way that we ought not be badgering others to change, we should not be overly condemning of ourselves when we slip and fall short. We go seek repentance. We turn to God for restoration, commit our way to Him, as the verse says, and ask His help in seeing our faults and in overcoming our faults. So God wants all of us to be in His family. And of course, He's given a calling to each one of us. So let's make sure that we are helping in that calling, that we are going to Him, that we are asking Him, how can I help my brother? that we are praying for our brothers and sisters, and that when we see something that we think, maybe I can be of use here, maybe this difficulty that this person seems to be having is, is something I've dealt with before. You know, Father, please show me if I should go and intervene, and, and if I do, please give me the words to help. Because we all have addictions that we're overcoming. We all have faults that we're working on and we want to make sure that we are doing things the way that God would have us do them.